Oscars uh, Rich Rines and Brendan Sido. So before we say the highs, I just wanted to remind all of the Kortoshis to ask relevant questions in the comment sections for a chance to get them answered by the contributors and get a whitelist for Kortoshis NFT collection that is coming soon. So without further ado, hi Rich, hi Brendan. I'm thrilled to have you both here. So let's dive into some questions. Um, Although many in our com community know you, especially with the hashtag choose rich uh, going viral, could you both briefly introduce yourself and explain your contributions to CORE? Happy to kick us off with, with that tee up and it's a great hashtag. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, so I'm rich. Um, I got involved in crypto back in 2013, you know, fell in love with, with Bitcoin after, you know, reading the original white paper. And decided to make it my, you know, my career. A few, uh, uh, a few years later, spent some time at Coinbase, leading money movements, engineering. That was a lot of fun. Met so many amazing people. However, it became a big company, and I've been, you know, building companies, you know, since I was, you know, in the dorm room and that sort of thing. And as soon as companies get too big, I can't do what I do best, which is, you know, take things from from zero to one and to help, you know, build an amazing team. On top of that. You know, having been in the crypto space for a long time, no one was scaling Bitcoin. And that's something deeply, deeply important to me, having been, you know, one of the, the early kind of Bitcoin folks, as I truly believe from like a philosophical point of view that, that Bitcoin should be in the hands of everyone uh, around the globe. And that's not possible on Bitcoin L1. It's just too expensive. It's too slow, which make it amazing is this global settlement layer but not necessarily for medium of exchange or for actually, you know, using it for, for day to day things. And that was, again, part of the you know, original genesis of core was to help, you know, Bitcoin scale. And we'll probably be doing a lot of talking about that uh, as we go over here. But that's a, a little bit about me and, you know, why I'm so excited to, to be part of core. Brendan, I'm going to jump in. Yeah. OK, cool. So thanks. Thanks for teeing that up. And uh, Rich, this is cool. I think of all the, since mainnet, I mean, this might be the first time we're on a stream together or, or Twitter space. We're norm normally dividing and conquering. So this is a, this is a special moment here, but, uh, but yeah, just, just brief background. So, so similarly uh, started kind of building companies in university. Uh, yeah, first non-tech non companies, then eventually led to first, first tech startup that I founded yeah, called right. Joist. Um, so I scaled that about 10 years or so and ended up uh, selling that company to, uh, to Silver Lake. And that kind of, in my view, was kind of like my MBA or kind of gave me all the uh, operating experience in tech. Um, but it always had a really deep interest in crypto for, for just, just under a decade. Not, not quite as early as uh, Rich, Rich and the team here, but you know, someone in tech had always been interested and in kind of dabbling on the side. And uh, after the last company um, started to travel the world, the kind of non-sovereign money and, uh, non, uh, and, and sovereign lifestyle really spoke to me. So it kind of got deeper and deeper down the Bitcoin rabbit hole, ended up meeting some contributors on the core team, got really excited by the mission here and unlocking more use cases and utility for, for a technology that I think is so important. And it was a no brainer to join. So contributing in a variety of areas at the moment, and it's been really exciting. Okay, thank you for this intro. So what let's go to the first questions uh, about core and Bitcoin. So what makes Bitcoin so secure? And what impact does it make uh, bringing the security to core? Yeah, so let me uh, yeah. let me hop on that one. And I think we might have done one other live stream. Like if my memory goes back, I think it was with Pit. I think that's the only one in the whole history of course. So we'll have to that's tag true. team more. We did do Pit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, we'll have to tag yeah. team more of these in the future. Um, but yeah. yeah, in terms of what makes Bitcoin so secure. Um, so proof of work is this beautiful, uh, this beautiful technological slash economic system that's in perfect harmony. And the, and the way to think about it is you have this expenditure of energy by solving these difficult puzzles, for lack of better words, and that gives you a probabilistic chance of finding the next Bitcoin block, which then gives you these Bitcoin block rewards, which decrease you know, every four years by half. 
and there's only 21 million Bitcoins. And what's happened through Bitcoin mining over the years, you've over the years, you've gotten more and more specialization, right? So you went from people being able to mine on CPUs in their house to then GPUs, then to ASICs, and it's gotten progressively like more and more specialized over time. So despite the fact that anyone can, in theory, participate, the odds that you yourself will ever find the block is, is quite low. But that is something very special about, um, about Bitcoin that most other crypto economic systems have never been able to, to fully achieve. And that's one of the reasons that Bitcoin has such a loyal community amongst others is that it has this very egalitarian nature where it is truly open access. And what we've seen is as time has gone on, it's become increasingly capital, uh, capital intensive to actually participate, to, to wind up being more and more involved in this system. But that brings a bunch of security alongside of it because there is so much expenditure that goes into finding these blocks. And you can actually directly calculate Hey, here's the amount of energy that went in to producing a block and actually look at the ROI and the revenue that these miners are, are putting off, as well as, you know, some of the mining pools. And when Core was, you know, figuring out its own economic system, it wanted to borrow some of these beautiful pieces of proof of work while still remaining its own independent blockchain. And that's actually where the Satoshi Plus idea came from was on one side, you had delegated proof of stake, and on the other side, you had this delegated proof of work where the Bitcoin miners and mining pools actually get to reuse their hash rate when they produce blocks on the Bitcoin chain to help trustlessly delegate that over. And then as of April, non-custodial Bitcoin staking came out, which will be the focus of, uh, of, of today. A third prompt was actually added, which not only helped get the Bitcoin miners involved on the Bitcoin side, but also the Bitcoin stakers as Bitcoin holders. Because Core itself is trying to be this exogenous block reward for Bitcoin on one side to help keep Bitcoin decentralized and secure, so that Core itself is decentralized and secure on one side. So it creates this nice balance, this symbiotic behavior. And by being the, the most Bitcoin aligned chain, there really is so much opportunity for Core to you know, be one of the, the leading scaling solutions for Bitcoin. But it was kind of a new take on some of these early ideas of how to bring in the, the Bitcoin community into the core chain. And that's something that is so special to, to the core story overall. And uh, Brendan, would you like to add anything? Or? I think Rich can cover the, the background of Bitcoin you know, in most detail. And I mean, I think you shared the story of how you heard of Bitcoin, Rich, which was like, you know, I think it, it's like this pretty wild story from a professor, right? Who kind of like got, got you initially delivered these early ideas. Yeah, no, so we, we actually heard about Bitcoin. I think it was in 2011. Uh, or is it, is it yeah. early 2011 or late 2010, um, but we had we had a professor um, and he was telling us about this like Byzantine generals problem. It was this essentially hack on actually doing real schoolwork. You could like cozy up to a professor and they would just like give you some of these like interesting topics. And we did one on computer security and we were just like blown away by it, but had no idea what it meant. Like we were like, this is so fucking cool. Like there's I don't know, a lot of swear and truth. Uh, we were like, this is, this, this is so cool that, uh, that you created this like digital money, right? Like, and at that point, there was really this belief that Bitcoin was going to be this better money throughout all of, um, throughout all of, you know, the internet and beyond. And, and it was just like kind of this mind blowing concept, but it didn't fully click if that makes sense. Like I, I understood, yeah. but it was mostly Silk Road. Like there wasn't a lot of stuff going on at that point, but then 2013 is when it really clicked. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, kind of, I, I saw the, the future direction, if you will, but yeah, it was, it was a pretty interesting, uh, how we got onto Bitcoin originally. Okay. And uh, so getting to the main topic of today's stream, the non-custodial BTC staking. So for some Kartoshis who might still be a little confused, what exactly is non-custodial BTC staking with core? Happy to jump in there, Rich, and then, and then we could both jump on this question. So, uh, so when, when you think of Bitcoin, which Rich just spoke about in detail, 
Um, there is no native staking function or yield or risk free rate for Bitcoin. It's really miner driven. That's what makes it really special. Um, but as a Bitcoin holder, you don't uh, necessarily have staking like a lot of the you know, newer advancements in, in blockchain like ETH and a variety of others, and then even the initial core chain where you can stake core. So what's really interesting of, of what core has built here with its non-custodial staking product and including Bitcoin as part of its overall consensus, kind of expanding into those three components, is uh, it's bringing a native yield to Bitcoin holders. Um, so what, what they can do is basically issue a time lock on Bitcoin, which is basically them giving up the ability to use, spend, uh, you know, or use that asset. So they're giving up the, the ability to use it for a specific period of time, but they have the peace of mind of knowing that their Bitcoin has not left their wallet, um, which is really important for, for Bitcoiners who may have been burned in a variety of other yield opportunities. You wouldn't even call them staking per se, but uh, you know, traditional finance, land, land borrow markets, et cetera. A lot of Bitcoiners were, were burnt on that and it didn't necessarily align with, uh, with the Bitcoin community. So what's really interesting about this approach is uh, you know, the, the mechanics are really unique, but as a Bitcoiner, you basically get uh, the peace of mind that your coins are in your wallet, which is very important. Um, and then from there, they're, they're basically you know, selecting a validator to stake to. We use that in our consensus to elect validators. It helps strengthen the uh, the core network. And that's generally, uh, the, I think we're going to go into a lot more detail there. But uh, the non-custodial approach was really important because uh, Bitcoiners don't like to give up their keys. Generally, uh, you know, mo most folks generally don't like to do that. And this was a very novel approach to, to bring Bitcoin security. We already have 200 million staked. I think well over 3,000 Bitcoin and growing in an ETP product uh, to help secure core chain. Okay, and uh, so why is non-custodial uh, so important overall and in particular for BTC holders? So I, I think the way to think about it, and Brendan did a great job of like teeing up some of the kind of the, the technical mechanics and why it's so important to, to kind of have architected it in this way. But I think it's important to kind of take a step back and, and look at Bitcoin, you know, for the last 10, 15 years. And if you look at it, Bitcoin was really, for lack of a better word, just digital gold. And what it was, you would just hold it and it would accrue more value over time, hopefully. And that was really the limit of what you could do with your Bitcoin if you wanted to take no, like no or limited private key risk, right? Like you wanted just to kind of hold on and get upside exposure to Bitcoin. And, and that was really it. If you wanted to go out and get, you know, additional yield on your Bitcoin, like Brendan mentioned, you'd have to probably trust some centralized group. And if we look at, you know, the last cycle in particular, that was a really bad bet, right? You're, and, and that was something where many Bitcoiners got burned by that. And the last thing that they wanted to do again was to go back down that road. So this was really a missing primitive of the Bitcoin ecosystem was a safe and secure way to be able to get additional yield on top of your Bitcoin. And what it's really kind of created at a macro level is almost to think about as like a Bitcoin bond layer. And what I mean by that is this is now like the, the Bitcoin reference rate or like the risk free rate to think about it like traditional financial terms for Bitcoin, where now if you want to look at, you know, what is the what, what rate am I willing to pay to like have my Bitcoin borrowed from me or, or to lend out my Bitcoin? It should be an excess of that rate, right? Like it's this new primitive that structured products in the Bitcoin space can get built around. And that's this, this massive unlock for bringing Bitcoin based finance mainstream. And I think we'll see more and more kind of innovations on that side from the core, from the core team and beyond throughout later this year. But another like kind of lens maybe to, to think about it through is if we look at the Ethereum world and we look at all of the innovation that happened since the merge, where once, big, uh, once Ethereum became this yield producing productive asset, all of these new financial primitives could be brought online. And then since then, we've actually seen the rise of eigenlayer and restaking, and we've seen tens of billions of dollars come into these markets. 
because there is this much larger desire to get these assets to be more productive. And I think we've, you know, kicked this off for, uh, for the Bitcoin world, but there'll be a bunch of other interesting kind of pieces that, that get built on top of it. But it's a super exciting time to be in the Bitcoin space overall. And then it's great for a core chain to be, to be leading the pack. Yeah, and with, with that, Rich, uh, there's kind of like the, the next phase, right? Where you've kind of brought this reference rate for Bitcoin. And then obviously what happened with, with Ethereum was there were, there were liquid derivatives. So it not only brought this reference rate and, and native yield, and then there was a whole economy built on the, the LSTs and deploy, you know, deploying those assets into different protocols and, and being able to do things. So that, that's really exciting kind of trend that we're seeing in the in the Bitcoin space generally and something that you know see being brought to the core ecosystem pretty quickly. Yeah, I think we're gonna see a variety of new primitives built on top of core staking because it is this almost like Bitcoin Lido on one side where yep. it's this new composable building block for folks to build on top of. And of course the the core ecosystem will have some of these pieces that get built natively. But there's a whole bunch of teams and protocols that we've been chatting with in various ways that have now kind of unlocked this new primitive for, for lack of better words, unlocking BitcoinDefi.com. Uh, and if you, uh, if, if you go into it, this, this new primitive kind of opens up that whole, you know, kind of like secondary economy, if you will, that we saw happen in the, uh, in the Ethereum world. And I think it's helpful to think about, again, like Core has kind of kicked off this movement but there is so many other pieces that will get built off of this. Yeah, hundred percent. And so, so for the folks listening, just to make that really simple, you know, as a Bitcoin holder, you'll be able to uh, stake Bitcoin, right? Or you use some sort of protocol to help uh, secure a core chain with your Bitcoins. So it's being staked, non, not uh, ideally non-custodially, right? With through the uh, through the platform. Um, and it's earning this reference rate yield. But what's interesting with, you know, what we're seeing with other builders kind of jumping on these opportunities, they'll probably provide some sort of, uh, you know, LST or restaking token so you can earn that yield. Obviously there's gonna be different trust assumptions. So everyone needs to do their own research. But what's interesting is you're kind of earning this reference rate on your Bitcoin that's being powered by CoreChain. And then you can actually get a, a minted token to go use in, you know, money market or uh, go trade it or, or, you know, do all these other really interesting things. So you're kind of, uh, you're getting the value of the yield and then you're getting the, the value of the usability on chain, which we're really excited about, kind of builds this greater economy uh, over time. And, and uh, that's something we're excited about. Uh, I think the other thing, you know, just with, you know, people are like, well, what's, what's the non-custodial staking bringing to Bitcoin? You know, generally, we've already seen what, like I think, two hundred million staked. Uh, we we expect that to get into the billions soon. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of folks are kind of opening up their 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 interest in this product, and they want to put their Bitcoin to use. But we're we're bringing a lot of economic security to the chain, and I think Rich, you you've kind of touched on this in in uh, previous spaces and things, but it's really uh, helped strengthen the core network generally. Right, you, you have basically three things uh, that validators validators need to go get at scale. It's really difficult to go get tens and soon hundreds of millions of Bitcoin. Go get you know a large percentage of the mining hash and then a ton of core tokens and try and take over this uh, this network and, and and try and get elected with multiple validators. So it's really strengthened the network uh, very quickly over the past. A couple months and it's also kind of brought this bridge of the bitcoin community uh which is kind of the ultimate goal in, in unlocking a lot of these bitcoin use cases but it's kind of helping bridge that gap between the bitcoin and core community so that's been really exciting to see yeah i think that's that's a really helpful macro frame and i think one other piece that you mentioned that that i should have highlighted as well was this is also like these new primitives are what's going to help unlock bitcoin becoming the dominant asset by tpl Right, like Bitcoin yeah. for so long has kind of been ignored in the DeFi world, if that makes sense. And there's a variety of reasons for, for why that was the case. But I think and I, I've kind of given this pr uh, prediction on you know a bunch of podcasts and, and Twitter spaces is 
I think, you know, within three years, we see Bitcoin flip Ethereum in terms of being the dominant asset by TVL. And I think we'll start to see a lot of these DeFi protocols built for Bitcoin or it's Bitcoin denominated. I think a lot of that activity will happen on core chain. I think being a, a Bitcoin aligned ecosystem is pretty critical to that story and being able to bring over Bitcoin through LSTs or through trust minimized bridges or through HTLC atomic swaps. Like you'll need the right avenues to enable this for Bitcoin holders. And all of this, on yeah. top of the security pieces that, that you mentioned, which are 100%, you know, the, the critical like kind of piece of the story, it's also that this provides the first leg of exposing Bitcoiners to DeFi. And what I mean by totally. that is this way yeah. kind of dip your toes in the water, let me go earn yield in a safe way. And then if you want to go in, you know, engage in some of these protocols on top of core, you can, of course, swap or bridge or do every, whatever you want to get over there that meet, meets your trust assumptions. But this is kind of the beginning step. And I think we'll see a funnel where it's like at the beginning, a bunch of this will just stake. And then over time, more and more of that will actually uh, occur on chain. Yeah, hundred percent. Talked about this kind of like stepped approach, right? All based on, on people's risk tolerances. And, and as you mentioned, it's so new that um, people just want, maybe want to dip their toes in just, you know, because there hasn't been any native yield or reference rate in the past, uh, the way Bitcoin's been designed. So this is, this is kind of like a natural first step. And then you're going to kind of see people go deeper, deeper down the rabbit hole as better opportunities come up, trust assumptions get better and, and just cool stuff is being built. Okay. And uh, so next question. Uh, so BTC staking position score as the best blockchain for hosting all Bitcoin based finance. Could you elaborate on that a little bit more? So I think we touched on, we had kind of a meandering <laughs> last answer there, but I think that's how you want like, to see like genuine conversation between people that are really excited about, you know, what, what's been crafted and, and brought to the world here. And I think it's, you know, the more organic it is, the more, um, the, more the nicer it is for the community to kind of see that these conversations. But I think, uh, I, I think in general, like to summarize kind of what we said was with the new primitive of Bitcoin staking, it allows more and more of these Bitcoin folks to get involved in BTC Fi or Bitcoin DeFi in the way that most aligns with their interests or their goals, whether it's just stopping at Bitcoin staking or diving into, you know, uh, any sort of like decentralized finance on chain, whether it's perps or borrow lend or like, you know, Bitcoin MakerDAO, like whatever one kind of matches whatever goal that you're out there trying to achieve. And we think, again, with Bitcoin becoming the dominant asset by TVL, it'll happen on a Bitcoin aligned chain like Core. And, and I think that's a transition that we expect to see, you know, within the next three years. I think some people have projections that are like five years out. Some people have it, you know, more aggressively on like one year out. But I think this this new primitive of Bitcoin being a productive yield bearing asset has really shifted the Overton window on what people think is possible with Bitcoin. And, I know people like Brendan and myself, we spend a lot of time actually just educating folks on now what's possible in, in Bitcoin, because after so long, it really just stopped at, hey, here's something I just hold and, you know, expect it to accrue value one day. And I think this is a big narrative for all of crypto right now is that there's so much potential in Bitcoin and just so much untapped capacity. And it's always nice when you're helping to bring something, you know, fundamentally new to the world and, I think, again, Core's Bitcoin staking is a one of one product. No one has anything like that in, in market today. And, and with it, there's been this whole new uh, this whole new kind of offering with some of these institutional products as well, with now the holders of some of these you know, products that trade on you know, uh, different exchanges around the world now have yield bearing Bitcoin uh, products that are powered by Core's yield. So it's not just about like positioning the on-chain offering, it's also like the institutional offering in all the potential there. We saw so much excitement around Bitcoin ETFs and things like that earlier this year. And there's no reason that those can't be yield bearing as well in the future. And Core is trying to help bring Bitcoin yield to all of the, the different Bitcoin holders, because at the end of the day, Core wants to be the most Bitcoin aligned chain. And, being the most Bitcoin aligned chain has so much potential for, for the core ecosystem. Bitcoin is easily the, the largest asset in, in the crypto space. And 
trying to help scale Bitcoin is, is very good for core. Yeah, I, I always think of this dinner, but we were at a dinner with a friend and they were talking about, you know, per, per the Overton window comment, but it was like, you know, with this, with Ordinal's runes and, and JPEGs, we have this friend who, who's like, you know, would you have thought Bitcoiners would be doing that even a couple of years ago? And we we're like, no, I don't, I don't think we would have thought people would be spending Bitcoin to buy NFTs and, and, and things like that and have kind of the the highest value, you know, some of the highest value NFT collections. And I think the approach here is, is somewhat similar to the kind of dip in the toes. We're, we're seeing uh, a lot of excitement and, and better, better technology to enable this, things like core that I think are really exciting for Bitcoin holders. Um, so yeah, that's, that's going to be uh, really great. I think the other key, maybe there's just one last thing, because I know there's a lot of Cortoshis in the, in, 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 you know, watching this here, I'm seeing some great comments pop up. And the question's like, you know, why, why, why do we want Bitcoin state or why do we want Bitcoiners as, as part of this community? Well, the thinking is, you know, there's just, there's so much to Rich's point, like, and he's made that bold prediction with, uh, you know, the, the TBL being higher than ETH. There's just so much liquidity there. And demand for Bitcoin is is just growing more and more with the having these ETFs, uh, more institutional awareness. It's just more and more people want, want Bitcoin. And, you know, I think that's going to be an even bigger valued asset. And you know, tapping into that liquidity is very powerful for a core chain. That's really the, you know, one of the missions of the chain is to unlock this, uh, you know, right now, I think it's one, I don't know what the change of the market, but 1.3 trillion dollars uh you know, kind of sitting somewhat idle and that's that's a big opportunity for core and, and the core toshis to really unlock that and bring a lot of capital into the ecosystem which brings a lot of great opportunities better products it's going to attract more builders and uh, i think that's that's part of the exciting point of these new use cases like we've seen with you know derivative perp dexes money markets we're already seeing on core we're going to see as we've already talked about the restaking tokens um, we're, we're excited to see what else is going to be built on core by great builders. And that just benefits core Toshis, uh, you know, who want access to great, uh, great products. And, uh, and, and I think there's one other piece here and I'm like following along with, um, with, with some of the, the comments as well. And I think Brendan did a great yeah. job. So people that are like just joining now, I think it's helpful to kind of go back to the beginning where Brendan talked about kind of the, the economic security angle and what Bitcoin staking brings to the core chain. I think it's also helpful to take uh, to take a look at the you know, TBL of, of core as well. And if you look at DeFi Llama, which is like kind of the de facto you know, solution for tracking TBL today, and you look at core's TBL mix, you're going to see a ton of Bitcoin. And that's by design. And that goes to Brendan's point around being a very Bitcoin aligned chain is you want the dominant asset by TBL on your chain to be Bitcoin. And that's the potential here where, again, there's over a trillion dollars of Bitcoin today that could theoretically start to move into ecosystems like core. And I think that you can see that this alignment with the Bitcoin holders is absolutely critical to go do that. And there's so much potential there. It's pure value add to be aligning core with the Bitcoin chain. And you can look at that by looking again, not just from the economic security lens, but also all these Bitcoin DeFi protocols, the Bitcoin TDL that's all coming onto the chain. And that potential to be the most Bitcoin aligned chain is a very valuable position to be in. And core is you know, currently really well positioned to be so. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Yeah, so definitely. So we already know uh, why Core prioritizes Bitcoin scaling. How does it support Core? Uh, we covered all of the BT, the non custodial Bitcoin staking, uh, everything. But uh, I'm wondering what's next for Core and Bitcoin then? So I'm happy yeah. to, uh, I'm happy to die. Oh, sorry, after you. No, no, I think you're, you're probably, it's better to, to share some, some vision items here on your end. So, yeah. Yeah. So let me, uh, let me kind of dive into that. Um, so we're really like 1% of the journey 
through like unlocking you know the potential here maybe half a percent or 0.1 percent like there's so much opportunity here that still needs to be unlocked and if you think about it like core's mission again is to help unlock this you know trillion dollars in traffic bitcoin liquidity at 1.5 whatever kind of the market is today and and with that there needs to be solutions designed for all of these you know different folks and there's again the beginnings of a bunch of these offerings but still so much more to be done here and the ecosystem on the core side is really just just kicking off but i think you'll see a lot more on the ecosystem side soon i think Victoria mentioned in the beginning some stuff with the the core Toshis and that sort of stuff in the NFT collection. So definitely something to to uh, to pay attention to. But I think it's all about building again like the most compelling product. And you'll see more and more of these pieces get released by teams building on top of core. There's now like a hundred plus protocols that are launched with even you know orders of magnitude I think behind that. And then on top of it, you'll see new native pieces get built by the core team itself as well. And I think we're yeah, we, we have to figure out when the, the Twitter space will exactly be, but I think we'll do like a full um, a full roadmap uh, kind of announcement piece where we walk through some of the major pieces that will come out in H2 of 2024. And then we'll go into, you know, some of the stuff for, for next year and beyond. But I think it's, it's safe to say the core team is very product focused in terms of trying to build stuff that meets the needs of Bitcoin holders and core holders on a daily basis and trying to further that alignment between these two chains based on how much opportunity there is to be the most Bitcoin aligned scaling solution. So a little bit of a cliffhanger because I think we need to do like a longer kind of roadmap piece there, but I think it will be exciting and we'll, we'll get it on the, uh, we'll get it on the books. I think he, I think Rich nailed it. So I don't have much to add. Uh, other than, you know, just, just something fun, which is, which is like, as Rich mentioned, still pretty early, you know, oftentimes joke, like crypto moves pretty fast. You, you, you know, let's say you're in the crypto community, like Cordoshi's for a year and, and it feels like five years has gone by. So the, like even a year ago in, in, in talking to people, you know, this whole, uh, vision, what core was working on, it was, you know, a lot of folks were, were, were not sure you know, what, what we were working towards and it, it wasn't really clicking even just like a year later, it's, it's clicking with everyone and there's massive excitement, uh, around this opportunity. I think everyone's seeing it. You're seeing a lot of folks try and do similar things. Um, but obviously core has been pretty mission focused for years now and is well ahead, you know, first to launch these products as, as Rich mentioned, very product focused. Uh, so, so in a really, really great position, but it's just still very early. So really excited to just see what's built on core, see a lot more Bitcoin be brought into the ecosystem, uh, you know, much, much higher liquidity. And that's, that's going to benefit the entire core Toshi community. Okay. Sounds, uh, sounds super exciting. Yeah. Rich would like to say something. Okay. Um, so, uh, I think that's that for, for the questions from my side. Um, so, and now I would like to choose some questions from the community that will reward with the uh, whitelist for the Kurtoshi's NFT collection. Uh, so maybe for the first question, uh, I will choose, um, let me find it among the questions here so from light how secure is my bitcoin stake on core um and uh, on core chain was being non-custodial what protocol is used to secure my btc and can i be rest assured uh, that even if i leave my btc on core for years um i'm safe yeah so let me give you kind of the uh Kind of a, there's a couple different pieces to this to this question um so for one in terms of we'll take the kind of second part first in terms of like if you leave your, your bitcoin on core so you're not actually leaving your bitcoin on core in that case it's actually staying on the bitcoin l1 the entire time which is really important to, to think about 
Many of these other like Bitcoin yield solutions and that sort of thing actually involve giving up the keys, sending, so you're either sending it to a multi-sig or some sort of like centralized group. And they might, you know, go trade that in some way, even if it's like a safer kind of trade. But with that, there is risk involved in that system that goes beyond just private key risk. And that's a very important piece. And, and I've said this on a number of podcasts as well, where if you don't understand where the, where the yield is coming from, you are the yield. So it's important to, to really understand kind of the, the nuts and bolts of whatever you're getting into. But what's nice about that is because it's never leaving your wallet on the Bitcoin side, you only have to trust Bitcoin. You actually don't even need to trust CoreChain in that case, which I think is important. And that is, again, a very unique and singular offering, um, not only today, but I believe in the future with, with how it was designed. And then in the, the second part of the question is, you know, how do I, um, how is it actually, you know, helping to secure the, the core chain? I think Brendan did a great, uh, great job covering this at the beginning. And the idea behind it is it increases the economic uh, security budget to attack core. Because now there's three hard to get commodities uh, to elect a, a validator on core. There's the core that's staked, the Bitcoin that's staked, and then the mining hash that is, that is delegated none of which are particularly easy to come by and it grows on a daily basis in terms of what, you know, what it takes to be a validator that gets elected in the core ecosystem. Okay, and the fantastic answer. And now another question is, so will there be products stake or get Bitcoin in the future? So this is something that the team is actively looking at it's very difficult to do trustlessly, which is really important to the core team. So I think it is very interesting and something the team is trying to think of solutions on the best way to do it. I don't think it's a like immediate term thing, just to be totally clear, but it is something that we've heard uh, demand from various groups. So it's something to investigate. I think it's important though that the core team doesn't want to compromise on principles. And what we mean by that is we want it to be safe and trustless, no matter you know what we're, we're trying to offer at the end of the day, those are always the design goals that we're after. So it's a hard problem, but something we're, we're actively looking at. Okay, and uh, Brendan, you would like to add anything? No. no. Okay. No, that's great. Yeah, uh, so maybe one more question from, uh, from the comments uh, from Maki, it's going to be probably it's a similar one who um, to the previous. I think it's better. It's not a question, but maybe a suggestion. I think it's better for staking Bitcoiners to receive core BTC instead of core. Core BTC can be used in DeFi activities within core ecosystem. So I think this kind of goes into the previous answer that I gave um, a little bit, which is there's different ways to potentially, if that uh, if that direction is chosen, to go down the like rewards in, in Bitcoin approach. And one of those potential solutions would be to actually have it be received in like a derivative asset of Bitcoin versus you know native Bitcoin itself. And those are other pieces that are being looked into as part of the potential solution space. And it might have to be like a Bitcoin derivative versus native Bitcoin. What I would say is all of these like kind of potential solutions are you know being looked at. Okay, and uh, so I think do you guys see any more questions that you would like to maybe answer or there? Let me see. Do, do, do. There's one about uh, OKX wallet, which was pretty pretty interesting at the start. And it's connecting the Coinbase wallet and others so that they can maybe stake through wallets or, or apps. And I think that's something from that, uh, yeah, from Core Pepe. Great name, by the way. Yeah. I've definitely seen. So, so yeah, basically, uh, that that is definitely something the core contributors are looking to collaborate with. You probably saw Element Wallet, right? Element Wallet actually integrated. Bitcoin stake. I think they were the first to do so, right, Rich? I'm pretty, pretty sure they were the first, at least. So what you're seeing now is more and more wallets are, are being added 
because you know the Bitcoin environment's a little different. So we're the team is adding more and more Bitcoin wallets to interact with Bitcoin staking. The other big one that's being worked on is, is Fireblocks. So obviously, you can use Fireblocks within Core, the EVM system, and very close to to having the you know the integration where you can use it for Bitcoin. But the, you know the goal is to get full wallet support for for a variety of wallets, and then even just take that a step further to, to you know have have that experience embedded. In, in wallets and, and exchanges and, and custodians, where you know you can imagine a user clicks a button, uh, and they're with one click they're basically staking Bitcoin and then eventually staking Core. It's definitely something that uh, the Core team is super excited about and uh, and pushing forward on. And what I would just add to that is again, it's an open and permissionless system, so anybody can can build these things. Yep. The you know DAO itself is trying to help promote this as, as much as possible in terms of yep. like helping people understand what's the easiest path to integrate, what the crawl walk run might be to go do that. Yep. And I think the element team did a great job of showing like kind of like what a one click flow can look like and. It's important that these things are, you know, end to end, where it's really seamless and easy, and then also that you can stake your core as well, so it's not just purely um, Bitcoin focused. But there's a lot of work to be done there to support every wallet. But to Core Pepe's question, you know, ideally every wallet will support, you know, core and Bitcoin. Yep. If you're building a wallet, reach out. Definitely. And uh, yeah, thank you for that. And I think with uh, this answer, we can finish with the questions from, from the community. Uh, thank you for asking those questions, Kortoshis, and congrats. We will be reaching out to you today to claim your prizes. And on, on YouTube or on X, we'll be, be reaching out. So for uh, in the end, like Rich, Brandon, would you like to add anything before we wrap up? I'm happy to just kind of quickly wrap up. Thanks everybody for coming. The Kortoshi community is again, one of the strongest communities in all of crypto. We're so lucky to have such an amazing community behind the, the core chain and all the folks that, that are working on it. So many amazing builders, so many amazing users. So as always, we, we really appreciate all the support. And again, so much left to, to do this year. So lots of exciting stuff coming up, but thanks so much for, for being our biggest supporters.